Welcome to Because the Beatles, the podcast about the Beatles, everything about the Beatles 24-8. I'm Erica. And I'm Allison. And before we start, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts or stream us on Spotify or YouTube. If you're enjoying BC the Beatles, feel free to leave us a preferably five-star review so other Beatle maniacs can find us. Also, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, slash X, and now TikTok. We'll be posting videos, photos, and more from this episode and beyond. And you can also email us at bcthebeatles at gmail.com. Well, we have a really fun show today. Actually, maybe we should say we have a really big show today. A really big show. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) If you don't know what we're talking about, you soon will. Yes. But before we start, first off, as of the day we're recording this, last night, the Beatles won a Best Music Video Grammy. Unreal. 2024, and they're still winning Grammys. I know. It was for I'm Only Sleeping, which I'm sure we highlighted this video when Revolver came out, because it's so beautiful. It's truly, well, literally a work of art. The artist has said it took over 1,300 individual oil-painted cells to create the animation. I don't know if you saw her speech, but she was saying something like this is dedicated to everybody who just needs to make art and has that drive to create and create. It was really Aww. nice. Yeah, I yeah. need to go back to YouTube to watch that. I, I missed that. I was watching a lot of the premiere ceremony, but that's awesome. And the Beatles beat out Billie Eilish in Kendrick Lamar. So, yeah, they still got it. That's amazing because, yeah, Billie Eilish has been just like raking them in, you know, I know. and she was phenomenal last night on the Grammys. Although I got to give a shout out to Ms. Joni Mitchell, who oh, I'm, yes. I know she was great. I am privileged to work on her records and her comeback has been nothing short of miraculous. And she's so inspiring. And I loved her performance last night. I thought it was really, really great. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. It's so wonderful. One more announcement. Erica, you're going to be somewhere very cool next weekend or this this coming weekend, I should say. Yeah, this coming weekend, February 9th, 10th and 11th, I believe, is the 60th anniversary of the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. And it coincides with the New York area fest for Beatles fans. This year, it's going to be at the TWA Hotel, which is near JFK Airport and is totally 60s retro. It's like the coolest place ever. Ugh, I'm dying to go. Really excited about that. So I'll be there on Saturday and Sunday, and I will be on a panel on Sunday. The panel is called A Women's History of the Beatles, and it discusses topics related to the book by the same name by Dr. Christine Feldman Barrett, who we had on the show in March of 2021. She is lovely. So if you're at the fest, please come by, say hi. I would love to meet people. Yeah, that would be so much fun. I unfortunately won't be there. I am mm. currently braving the uh, yeah the monsoon here in Los Angeles, but I can't wait to hear all about it. I can't wait to see pictures and get all the hot goss from the fest. So many of our previous guests are going to be there, like Ken Womack, Jude Sutherland Kessler. Plus some of our podcast buddies are going to be there. Um, Julia and Jonathan from Ranking the Beatles are going to be there. I think some of the Blotto boys are going to probably be in the bar. So look out for them. Yeah, but they are. <laughs> Jonathan's <laughs> actually playing a set on the Friday night. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's going to be a great weekend. So I can't wait to hear all about it, Erica. You'll have to fill us in. I'll be sending pictures. Oh, please. Yes. We can have some best TikTok action. Yeah. So that's so exciting. Well, we're talking about, you know, this weekend being the 60th anniversary of the Beatles landing in New York, coming to America. And it's pretty apropos for our topic today. And our topic today is the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. (laughs) Yes, it's so exciting to talk about this. And I can't believe it's the 60th anniversary. It seems like yesterday it was the 50th. And that was a truly epic fest for Beatles fans. That was in Manhattan. I believe the day of the anniversary, CBS Studios actually put up like a banner over the marquee that had the original names of the people who are going to be on the show that night so it, it was like very time trippy it was great um so yeah that was really fun and so i can't believe it's been 10 years since that and i feel very old well anyway so let's get into this because we've got a lot to talk about this is oh, obviously yeah. a massive event in beatles history a little bit of background before we get into ed sullivan in 1963, Beatlemania, already a huge deal in the UK, 
But the Beatles really hadn't had an impact in the U.S. yet. So their first single, which was Please Please Me, backed with Ask Me Why, was rejected by Capital, which was the U.S. arm of EMI, their U.K. label. And instead, it was released on a label called VJ on February 25th, 1963. Happy birthday, George. Well, one of them. Yes. Well, one of them, (laughs) as we've talked about, he has two, as uh, I'm sure everybody listening knows. So the single backed with From Me to You would later be re-released in January 1964 to cash in on the success of I Want to Hold Your Hand. So that was on BJ. So in May 1963, From Me to You would be released, but it didn't move the needle at all. It, it topped out at 116 on the Billboard charts, very far from the top 40. Yikes. Yeah, I know. Embarrassing. So that August, Capital canceled BJ's rights to distribute the Beatles records as a result of non-payment of royalties. So BJ screwed the pooch on that. Although they will come back. We'll get to VJ again in a little bit. So in September 63, Capital once again declined to release the Beatles' next single, She Loves You. And it came out on the Philadelphia-based Swan Records. And again, went nowhere. In fact, funnily enough, Dick Clark played a video of the band performing the track on American Bandstand. And the kids in the audience, they just laughed at the Beatles' look. They thought their hairstyles were hilarious and so dumb. And this was August of 1963? Yeah, yeah. They'd be eating their words less than six months later. We all have to remember, we're so jaded by the fact that the Beatles became the Beatles. But up until this moment, there was no British act that had ever had real staying power in America. All of the superstars were American. Elvis, Frank Sinatra, all of the teen idols. There was really no reason to believe the Beatles were here to stay or would make any sort of an impact. Getting back to our friends at VJ and Swan, they would release all of their singles after Beatlemania hit America. Finally, we roll around to December 1963, and Brian Epstein successfully negotiated a deal with Ed Sullivan to feature the Beatles. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves. We'll get back to that later. But because of this deal, Capitol was finally convinced to release the Beatles' next single, which was, of course, I Want to Hold Your Hand. CBS Evening News actually ran a segment on Beatlemania in the UK. This was prior to their appearance on Ed Sullivan, obviously. Interestingly, the segment had originally been broadcast on the morning news on November 22nd, 1963. But as we all know, it was pulled from the evening news because that was the day that JFK was assassinated in Dallas. I didn't actually know this. I don't know if you knew this, Erica, but I want to hold your hand. John and Paul wrote it specifically because they thought it would appeal to Americans. I didn't, but I can see how, given what 50s American rock sounded like and what the topics were, that that would make sense to them. Yeah, hearing it, it kind of makes sense. The song quickly caught fire in December of 63, and Beatlemania officially began to take hold of America's youth. And this is really where our story today begins. Before we talk about the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, if you're not familiar with Ed Sullivan, let's go through who he was, because he had a very, very interesting career even before he became one of the most famous TV hosts of all time. Ed Sullivan began his career as a newspaper reporter. He covered sports primarily, and he was actually a talented athlete, which shocked me. So in 1929, he took over gossip columnist Walter Winchell's Broadway column in the New York Evening Graphic. But he shortly left for the New York Daily News, where he also covered Broadway. And he also began broadcasting showbiz news on the radio. So he got very popular very quickly. And he and Winchell actually became bitter rivals also pretty quickly because Sullivan was so popular. And actually, Ed Sullivan, his career outlived Winchell. His column went away. And Sullivan, of course, as we'll find out, just skyrocketed. So in 1948, This is where Sullivan debuts his Sunday night variety show called Toast of the Town. Initially, both he and it received poor reviews. And some of these are pretty funny. For example, critic Harriet Van Horn accused Sullivan of having, quote unquote, no personality, to which he responded, quote unquote, dear Miss Horn, you bitch. Sincerely, Ed Sullivan. (laughs) There's some personality for you. I know, right? Yeah, have some personality, Harriet. But he had kind of an awkward demeanor. His face was sort of sour. He wasn't really like a lovey, fatherly persona like some other 
posts have been, but it kind of came to be endearing. People were sort of not threatened by him. And so he became a favorite for families. Toast of the Town would, of course, eventually become The Ed Sullivan Show. It was formally retitled on September 25th, 1955. Both Toast of the Town and Ed Sullivan, they typically featured vaudevillian type acts like acrobats, jugglers, magicians, performing animals, comedians, musical act, popular theater actors, athletes, and maybe a guest appearance by one of the show's recurring characters like Topo Gijo. Aww. Topo Gijo is pretty cute. He's a mouse puppet based on a 1960s Italian cartoon. Mm-hmm. So and you can find photos and video of Topo Gijo on YouTube and highly recommend. So Sullivan became regarded as a kingmaker in the world of entertainment. His show was a Sunday night ritual. The majority of Americans always tuned in. It was one of the gathering programs where they just huddle around the TV. And so its ratings would peak at number two behind the Jack Benny program in 1957 after featuring Elvis Presley on three shows that season. Sound familiar? Mm. So it's averaged that around 10 million people tune in every week. And it was so popular that the musical Bye Bye Birdie includes a song called Him for a Sunday Evening, which features an ode to Ed Sullivan. Because if you're familiar with the musical, which I love because we did in high school, um, but the family, yeah, but the family and Bye Bye Birdie is appearing on Ed Sullivan. So it was that popular and that ingrained in the culture at that time that it ended up in a Broadway musical. Ed Sullivan is a huge part of that show. Oh, yeah. It's like a thread throughout. And so this is 1960 too, Bye Bye Birdie. So it's like right in the slurp of Ed Sullivan's popularity. To date, as of this broadcast, our broadcast, <laughs> I'm like in the mode of the 50s now. It's like <laughs> our broadcast. Um, the Ed Sullivan shows amassed over 2 billion views across all social channels, including YouTube, Facebook, Apple Music, and more. Wow. 2 billion. That's insane. And it's not even that easy to find. I know. I mean, there are some clips on like YouTube and stuff. And I think you can find some clips on the Ed Sullivan website. Yeah, and actually only recently, maybe a month ago, the streamer called Freevee, which is like Amazon's free site, has started broadcasting the Ed Sullivan show, but it's not oh, like really? nightly shows. It's like clip shows by theme. Oh, weird. But there's a whole bunch of them on Freevee now. Oh, that's good to know. I think there was like a DVD series. I know I have a DVD of the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, all of their appearances, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be a way to see full episodes. Eric and I were just talking about the commercials Mm, on Ed Sullivan, which is like a huge reason to watch it. (laughs) Love it. Yeah. And any sort of like retro TV that has the commercials in A plus Mm -hmm. A plus. So let's jump a little bit forward to Halloween 1963. So this is where the Beatles come into the picture in Ed Sullivan's life. And so this is the legend. And as we said before on our show, You can believe the legend. You can question the legend. Some of this stuff has become headcanon. We'll leave it to you to decide what really happened. But this is fact that on Halloween 1963, the Beatles returned from their tour of Sweden. And they landed at London Airport. And Ed Sullivan himself was also at the airport that day. He had just completed a tour of Europe doing some talent scouting for his show. And interestingly, also at the airport that day was the prime minister who was flying out. And the contestants for Miss World who were arriving. So busy day at London Airport. Made even busier because over 1,500 young fans were there waiting for the Beatles to arrive. And of course, Ed Sullivan's like, what is going on? Who the hell are the Beatles? He would later say that the hubbub immediately caused him to look into the Beatles. But there's more to the story. And this is where it gets interesting because there are so many different moving parts. And of course, people like to take credit. So again, pick and choose what you what you want to believe here. So another story goes that Jack Babb, who was Ed Sullivan's talent coordinator, spent summers in Europe. And his primary objective also was to find talent for the show. And he was assisted by London theatrical agent Peter Pritchard, who was Sullivan's European talent coordinator. Connecting the dots, Pritchard also knew Brian, And Brian would call Pritchard to ask for advice on occasion for his artists, which I think is pretty interesting because I wouldn't think of Brian asking for advice, but he must have really respected this guy. 
I could see him asking advice to a London theatrical agent. That was like Brian's circle, really. Yeah, I'm sure he held him in high esteem. During the summer of 1963, Richard took Bab to see the Beatles at least once that we know of. Neither of them really thought about booking the Beatles for the Sullivan Show. The Beatles hadn't really broken through yet in Britain, even though they'd had two number one singles and their album hit the top of the charts. The Beatles' big breakthrough really came on October 13, 1963, when they appeared on Val Parnell's Sunday Night at the London Palladium. And so note the date, October 13th. It's only a matter of weeks before Sullivan would encounter them at the airport. Sunday Night at the London Palladium was pretty much the UK equivalent of the Sullivan show. Everybody tuned in. It was a ritual. And the night the Beatles were on, it drew 15 million viewers. Not a small number. Mm -mm. They both opened and closed the show. And they played From Me to You, I'll Get You, She Loves You, and Twist and Shout. I'll get you. That's interesting. I know. Random, right? (laughs) Yeah. Very, very random, but great song. Great song. So this is, again, where the fans come in. So there were scads of screaming fans. They were in the audience. They were on the street. They were causing all kinds of commotion. And so the next day, coverage was all over the place. And this is when the term Beatlemania was officially coined by the Daily Mirror. So after Ed Sullivan encountered them at the airport, Then came the Royal Variety performance, which we covered in 2022 after the death of Queen Elizabeth. So you can go back and listen to more about that performance. But basically, the too long didn't read is they outshone the royal family members and attendants who were Princess Margaret and Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. Unfortunately, Queen Elizabeth couldn't go because she was heavily pregnant. So Mm -hmm. she missed the Beatles at Palladium. But this also spurred the infamous twist and shout introduction by john and again that has a very interesting story that we go into in our episode about that performance so the day after the royal command performance brian left for new york city with billy j kramer so he was going to promote billy j but he was also really curious to investigate why the beatles hadn't made a big yet in the u.s and he was kind of hoping to nudge beatlemania along there after he saw what happened in the uk now what were his plans for billy j I don't know. I mean, I know he did the same thing with Scylla, mm-hmm. you know, where he was kind of trying to build her profile over there, probably introducing Billy J to like promoters and bookers and maybe putting him on a showcase or two. I'm not really sure. That's a really good question. We could ask Billy J. <laughs> He'll actually be at the fest this weekend. There you go. Maybe you can ask him. Yeah. I've interviewed him, but I don't think I asked him about that trip. But yeah, we should have Billy J on actually. That would be great. Considering the 60th anniversary of the British invasion, he's a perfect guest. That is true. Okay, we're going to work on this. We're going to get Billy J on the show. And he has a new song out as well. So, and I think he's got a new album coming. Oh, yay. So, perfect timing. Yeah. Before Brian left for the U.S., Brian was contacted by Pritchard. If you guys remember, European talent coordinator for Sullivan. And Pritchard suggested he try to get the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and offered to negotiate a deal between Brian and the Sullivan people. But Brian was like, nah, <laughs> I can handle the negotiation myself. It's cool. And so Pritchard said when Brian was in New York, he'd set up a meeting with Ed Sullivan. So then Pritchard, as Pritchard would tell it, he pitched Sullivan on the Beatles. He told him about the fervor around the Royal Variety Show. He told him about Beatlemania. But again, the Beatles were still really unknown in America. So Sullivan said he needed an angle to present them. Pritchard told Sullivan that the Beatles were the first, quote unquote, long haired boys to be (laughs) invited to appear before the Queen, which sold him on possibly featuring the band. He still wasn't totally sold, but he was like, oh, that's pretty cool. It's not the best selling point. Do Americans really care that much? I don't know. I guess if the queen respects them enough to Mm. invite them to play for her, then that's all that matters. Brian met Ed Sullivan on November 11th, 1963 at Brian's suite at the Delmonica Hotel, and they had dinner the next day. Only Brian and Ed Sullivan were at that first meeting. So really, they're the only two that know what happened. But we do know that they tentatively agreed on February 9th, 1964, as the Beatles debut on The Sullivan Show. And then the following week, they'd be featured from the Deauville Hotel in Miami Beach. The negotiation terms were this. 
So Sullivan typically paid up to $10,000 for a single performance, but he offered Brian $3,500 for each show. And Brian agreed as long as the Beatles got top billing. Sullivan wasn't really into that at first. He considered it, but he was like, I don't know, are they really that much of a draw? In fact, for the Miami Beach show, they didn't get top billing. Mitzi Gaynor did, which is very funny. But Sullivan offered the money and then he offered to pay for transportation and lodging. So the Beatles also taped a performance for a later broadcast, which would be their third appearance on the Sullivan shows in February of 64. And for that, they were paid 3000 which if you do the mathing, um, it brings the total fee for the three shows up to ten grand. So Ed Sullivan got a big deal, but Brian was really shrewd and really wanted those three appearances. And per usual, per Brian's usual, he sealed the deal with a handshake. Sullivan later told the New York Times, I made up my mind that this was the same sort of mass hysteria that had characterized the Elvis Presley days. So, I mean, he must have had some sort of foresight. So Brian, after this kind of comes to fruition, he takes this and he says to Capitol, look, you need to put some real promotional campaign money behind. I want to hold your hand because they're going to be on Sullivan. It's going to be a huge deal. So Capitol puts forth $40,000, which, you know, in those days, pretty substantial Hmm. behind promoting the single. But the record already leaked and it was playing at radio stations across the country. Really, it broke for the first time in Washington, D.C. So Capitol is a little bit behind the ball at this point, but they formally released a single on their label on December 26, 1963. Initially, they ordered 200,000 units, which uh, not enough, not far enough. too few, <laughs> not even close, because by January 10th, 1964, the record had sold over a million units. And it hit number one in Billboard, Cashbox, and Record World. Now, our friends at VJ were looking to cash in on this, too. So Capitol rushed out the Meet the Beatles album. But VJ was like, we're going to put out our own Introducing the Beatles album, which hit number two on the Billboard charts right behind Capitol's Meet the Beatles album. And I was trying to think, I think I have a copy of that Introducing the Beatles album somewhere. Really? Yeah, I don't know if it's worth money, but <laughs> I think I do. I mean, the, I I know the cover. I'll have to look at my record collection. I'd be interested in what it sounds like because they probably did their own mixes, right? I would think so. I mean, they probably had their own masters of the singles they put out that Capitol rejected. But I don't know. Yeah, that would be interesting to know. As this was happening, I thought it was really cute. Receptionist at Capitol would answer the phone. Capitol Records, the Beatles are coming. Oh, that's so cute. I know. I love that. <laughs> I want to answer my phone like that. Just for shits and giggles. You can. And you should. It's America. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> God bless the USA. Now, I don't know if you looked into this or not, but I think there's an apocryphal story that the Beatles would always say, we're not going to America until we've hit number one. Right. But it seems like Brian negotiated this deal for them to go to America well before they did that. That is a good point. I mean, you know, we have the whole toppermost of the poppermost story at the George V Hotel in Paris. The legend goes, again, more legends, but they were having dinner after their performance. And Brian came in and told them to hit number one in the U.S. And that was what spurred the Ed Sullivan performance. But Yeah, it sounds like Brian had it negotiated far in advance in November before Capitol even released the single in the U.S. So interesting how these stories become almost fact. I know. And I mean, it could be they could have both happened, you know, but it's not the cause and effect that we're sort of led to believe. I don't think just thinking about the timeline. I think a lot of Beatles stories come about because they're joking and they sound serious to people who don't understand their humor. (laughs) I think that's fair. I think that's fair. And, you know, we said it before on the pod, but sometimes the Beatles are the worst historians of their own events. Oh, yeah. It's like playing telephone with themselves. And, you know, I think they buy their own bullshit sometimes. But you know what? It makes for good stories. So we will continue to tell them. There you go. So although most people credit Ed Sullivan with breaking the Beatles on American TV, Jack Parr 
was actually the first person to air a clip of them from the Royal Variety Show on January 3rd, 1964. It was the band singing She Loves You, complete with all the screaming girls. Naturally, Ed Sullivan was real pissed, very upset. He threatened to cancel the Beatles' appearance, but eventually he calmed down and he was like, all right, we'll keep them. But Parr, for his part, he did mention that Sullivan was going to have the Beatles on live in February. So a little preview there, kind of saved the day with that one. Not being a good sport. Yeah, exactly. So the Beatles coming to America. Very exciting. Yes. So by February, the Beatles were household names. They were everywhere. They finally broke in America. It was all happening for them. And before their U.S. visit, part of Capital's promotional campaign was leaking their schedule to New York radio stations because they really wanted the kids to show up. They wanted them to know every single detail of where the Beatles were going to be. And they were hoping to create, you know, the kind of pandemonium that Beatlemania was in Britain. They especially encouraged fans to show up on Friday, February 7th at JFK Airport to greet the band. And they sure did. They sure did. <laughs> so more than 5,000 teens stood on the airport's upper arcade to see the Beatles step off Pan Am Flight 101 shortly after 1.20 p.m. Keep in mind, this is a school day. They totally skipped school to do this, which, I mean, I would. They wouldn't even remember what they learned in school that day, but they got to see the Beatles land in America. Ringo said later, I believe he said this in the anthology, he said, on the airplane, I felt New York. It was like an octopus grabbing the plane. I could feel like tentacles coming up to the plane. It was so exciting. So we got off the plane and we were used to 10, 12,000 people, you know, it must have been 4 billion people out there. I mean, it was just crazy. It was fantastic. Oh, can you imagine stepping off that plane and to just, I know they were probably used to it because of London and, you know, around the world, but it's, this is New York. This is a big deal. You know who else probably had an unforgettable day? Are like the airline workers and all of the people <laughs> who never in their life expected that there'd be thousands and thousands of young teenagers screaming in their airport. Yeah, imagine how much they hated it. <laughs> Can't even. <laughs> like, can you picture like the New Yorkers? They're just like, I just want to get to work. After they land, the Beatles get whisked away to a press conference at the airport but honestly, the noise level was absolutely unreal in the room. Somehow um, at the press conference, they answered questions from more than 200 journalists and photographers. People asked about Detroit stamp out the Beatles campaign. They asked about their accents. They asked about their hair, of course, their thoughts on Beethoven and even retirement. And keep in mind, these are like 20 year old kids. Come on. Just ridiculous. I know. I was reading a bunch of interviews that they did while they were in New York. And it's like the dumbest fucking questions. Like, I, I don't know, just every reporter, they tried to be more condescending than the last. And it's so annoying. <laughs> I mean, even just as a, like, a journalist, you know, ask more intelligent questions. You make yourself sound stupid. It was clear that they had no thought about what this group was other than some kind of teenage phenomenon. And they wanted to be as silly as possible about it, which... At least the Beatles have the kind of sense of humor that they can take anything and make it funny and witty. But if they yeah. if they had lesser wit, these press conferences would have just bombed. Totally. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, you've got to be quick witted when people are trying to like poke holes in you. You know, they're trying to like figure out how to like really get at you, get under your skin. But yeah, they just took it on the chin. It was, you know, thank goodness they were able to do that. And of course, this inanity was captured in some way in a hard day's night oh yes <laughs> i mean that was pretty true to life the scene where they're being asked a bunch of dumb questions what do you call your haircut arthur yes so there was a lot of that so after the press conference the beatles finally got to leave the airport paul george and ringo got in one limo and john and cynthia took another brian mal and neil had to get a taxi <laughs> <laughs> to the plaza. Oh, I, it's so funny. They didn't even give a car to them. So Paul later said, I think, again, this was in the anthology. I remember, for instance, the great moment of getting into the limo and putting on the radio and hearing a running commentary on us. They have just left the airport and they're coming towards New York City. It was like a dream, the greatest fantasy ever. And of course, if you've ever seen the first U.S. visit, uh, it sort of commemorates this. And you could see them listening to their little transistor radio where it talks about the Beatles. Mm. 
So when they get to the plaza, there are hundreds of fans there, and they were held back by just 20 policemen on horseback. That's kind of underwhelming, I think. Again, I want to hear their experiences. I want to know what that was like for them. Those cops were like, fuck oh. this. <laughs> what an awful day. I know. So that night, they're kind of chilling in the hotel and they entertain guests, including the Ronettes, who, by the way, they'd spend a lot of time with the Ronettes. Later, they'd tour with them. But on this trip, especially, the Ronettes seemed to be everywhere. And I got to say Lucky Beatles, because I love the Ronettes yeah. and I would love to hang out with them. And so the Ronettes were hanging out in their suite, W.I.N.S. DJ Murray the K, which we should do a whole Murray the K episode because he's just like such a character. Mm hmm. He'd love to call himself the fifth Beatle. He'd love that. Murray the K is there, the Ronettes, and George's sister Louise was also there. And Erica, you actually interviewed Louise once. I did, shortly after her book, My Kid Brother's Band, was yeah. published. So it was her memoir of her time with George, and a lot of it covered that particular period. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we'll put a link to the interview Erica did for Rebeat Magazine in our show notes so you can check it out. So again, a lot of this was filmed for the first U.S. visit by the Maisels brothers, which you guys have probably heard of the Maisels. They were legendary documentary filmmakers. They would kind of specialize in music and art docs. They did a lot of those, although maybe the most famous documentary they did was Grey Gardens, which is fantastic. If you've never seen Grey Gardens, <laughs> you got to see it. Agreed. And then Albert Maisels actually worked with Paul McCartney again many years later on the 2011 documentary The Love We Make about Paul's experience in New York City on 9-11, which we talk about in our Freedom episode. I forgot we did a Freedom episode. I love that. I love that for us. We don't love the song Freedom, but we love the episode about it. I mean, I have mixed feels on Freedom. I go back and forth sometimes, but I don't know. It can be a bop. Mm. See our episode <laughs> for more. I won't repeat my rant. Okay. All right. All right. Yes, uh, we'll we'll leave it with that so you can uh, go back and listen. Very disappointed in you, Paul McCartney. <laughs> so the next day, Saturday, February 8th, 1964. So the morning, the Beatles held a press conference at the Plaza. Again, they did a ton of press during this whole trip. So much press. Afterward, John, Paul and Ringo went for a walk slash photo op in Central Park. I'm sure you guys have seen the photos. They're really cool. They're really cute. Meanwhile, as is infamously known, George was sick with the flu. Thankfully, Sister Louise was there and she cared for him. She said the doctor said he couldn't do the Ed Sullivan show because he had a temperature of 104, but they pumped him with everything. He was thinking about getting a nurse to administer the medicine every hour on the hour. And so George is laid up in bed. But in the afternoon, the three Beatles traveled by limo to the CBS studios for the first Ed Sullivan rehearsal. And we had Neil standing in for George at that point. And Neil would later say that there was a rumor that he actually played guitar and rocked it a little bit. But he's like, I never played guitar, but I'll take it. I'll take the credit for being a good guitarist. <laughs> if anybody overdubbed the Beatles and played their guitar that day, it was not him. It wasn't him. And we're going to tell that story in a little bit. So don't go away. because You will not want to miss that story. So, of course, you know, they're at the CBS studios. It's pandemonium outside, absolute chaos with the fans. Again, you know, on the radio, they're giving a play by play of the Beatles every move so the fans know exactly where they are. So, after they rehearse, they asked to see a tape of the rehearsal, which nobody had ever done before. It just showed how seriously they took this opportunity and they really wanted to critique what they looked like and, you know, how they sounded and, you know, how their performance would go the next day. And then they were interviewed by the Ronettes, which I couldn't find that interview, but I'd love to see it. And I would love to know what the Ronettes asked them, because I bet they asked really good questions. It's got to be somewhere. I know. And I don't know if it was print or if it was video. I, I have no idea. So if you guys know. Do you know who did it? Was it property of CBS Studios? I don't know. I don't know if it was for like a teen mag. I have no idea. I just learned about this, but I searched high and low, could not find it. So, yes, if you guys know anything about this interview the Ronettes did with the Beatles, please, please, please let us know, because I would be dying to see slash read it so much. Yeah. So that evening, they went to the very, very swanky 21 restaurant with Capital Execs and George Martin 
other than this particular day, where was George Martin? You never really hear about him in the context of this visit, but he was there having dinner. I'm shocked. Like, I didn't even know George Martin went on this little trip or showed up. No. He probably traveled by himself, but like, I had no idea. I don't believe I've ever seen a photo of the Beatles and George Martin on this trip. You see lots of Brian, but none of him. Well, yeah. I mean, you see a lot of photos of George Martin in Miami with them. There's a really, one of my favorite fucking photos of all time is George and Brian in a convertible. And it's like, I once upon a time, I uh, posted on Facebook and I was like, True Detective season three. <laughs> um, but it's so cute. We'll post it because I love that photo so much. But yeah, so George was definitely chilling in Miami with the Beatles, but I didn't. Yeah, you never hear about him in New York with them. So at this restaurant, the big news, get ready for it, is the Beatles had chops while the rest of the party had pheasant. Breaking news. Yeah, exactly. All right. Main event, Sunday, February 9th, 1964. George, still sick. He either had the flu. I also read he had tonsillitis. I don't think so, though, because he didn't get his tonsils out. So again, Neil stood in for him during that morning's rehearsal. And in the afternoon, the Beatles, including George this time, they recorded three songs, Puss and Shout, Please Please Me, and I Want to Hold Your Hand, for what would become their third and final appearance on these subsequent Ed Sullivan performances. And that would be broadcast on February 23rd. So that evening was the big, big shoe, the really big shoe. And... 73 million people watched the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in over 23 million homes. That's huge. That's a huge number. It would be a huge number even today. I don't think, well, especially with streaming, you could never get those numbers. And 723 people were in the audience. I didn't realize that was that big, but you've been in that theater, right, Erica? Yeah, I was lucky enough to see Paul McCartney in 2019 when he was interviewed there by Stephen Colbert. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm still so jealous. I mean, it really was amazing, though. I'm so short, I could barely see him, which drove me nuts. <laughs> so is it a big theater? Like, can you picture 723 people there? Um, It's not that big. It's like a small Broadway theater. So there's a balcony and an orchestra. You can see there's two levels from the Ed Sullivan performances. The balcony probably goes back like 15 rows and maybe the orchestra goes back like 24. It really is pretty small. If you're like an average sized person, I would guess you have no problem seeing anything from any seat in the house. That's what I always pictured. That's what it looks like on the broadcast. But yeah, I was surprised that it houses that many people. But yeah, of course, you know, another legend of their appearance in Ed Sullivan is that there were no crimes reported during the show. And George would later say... Even criminals took the night off to watch us on Sullivan. I don't think it was necessarily 100% true, but I think a more realistic number was that 40% of the United States was watching at the same time. Yeah, almost half of the United States, that which is crazy town. Yeah, and I just looked up some numbers. Last year's Super Bowl got 115 million people. Wow. We're talking 59 years later, so this number is enormous. Yeah, considering, you know, there are how many more millions of people in existence now than were in 1964. Yeah, and that the Super Bowl is essentially a national holiday in the United States, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this is absolutely massive. You know, you still hear people talk about watching the Beatles and Sullivan. It's one of those milestone moments that you just don't forget if you were there. Something that makes it really cool is like it really gave fans ownership of something and allowed them to be a part of something bigger. Even if you weren't mm -hmm. in New York, at the airport, at the plaza, you still felt like you were part of this massive historical moment by watching them on Ed Sullivan, which you were. You totally were. Oh, yeah. I mean, you hear people who were, you know, I think even Deirdre Kelly, who was with us a couple of weeks ago, was talking about how she was two, three years old and has this memory. Yeah. It's something I wish I could have experienced for sure. We're lucky to have really good high quality video to watch, but I can't imagine how exciting it was for, for kids. And I would love to hear everything the parents were saying. <laughs> I'm sure, oh, yeah. you know, I'm sure they had some strong opinions about these long haired boys on their TVs. Yeah, I think the general stereotype was that dad wanted to turn it off, but mom convinced him 
to let everybody watch. Yes. Yes. Well, of course, you know, you have the sort of balance, which is part of a larger thing we can talk about, you know, the long haired boys, but they're in nice suits. So it kind of evens things out a little bit, I think. Yeah. And, and Paul chose to sing till there was you. Right. A little Broadway moment, which kind of fits in with Ed's programming as usual programming. Yeah. It kind of makes them feel like they may have long hair, but they're fun for the whole family. Yeah, exactly. They're nice, clean cut boys. Ish. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. read the Mel Evans book. That's all I've got to say. (laughs) Oh, God. So on the show, when Ed Sullivan announced the Beatles, he mentioned that they had received a telegram from Elvis and Colonel Tom Parker that day, which read, congratulations on your appearance on the Ed Sullivan show and your visit to America. We hope your engagement will be a successful one and your visit pleasant. Give our best to Mr. Sullivan. Sincerely, Elvis and the Colonel. Which must have been pretty exciting, even though they were asked about it at a press conference. And George said, who's Elvis? Oh, Christ. (laughs) George. Oh, Jesus. But, you know, Elvis was their hero. So that must have been pretty cool. Yeah. On the show, they performed five songs. All My Loving, Till There Was You, as Erica just said. And Twist and Shout in the first half. And I saw her standing there and I want to hold your hand in the second half. During Till There Was You was the famous moment where the camera panned to each of the Beatles, showed their name, and John's famous, sorry girls, he's married, caption came up as well, which just makes me think of that thing you do every time. (laughs) Yeah. Watch out, girls. He's engaged. I love it. (laughs) What am I supposed to buy you some ring now? I don't don't think John knew that was coming. No, I don't. He's like, damn it. What did you tell everybody? <laughs> yeah, that's that's rough uh, for him. See the Mal Evans book. Yeah, see, again, Mal Evans book. There's probably a lot written about this, but I can't imagine Brian okaying that because it was like a big secret. But in 1963, obviously, everybody found out because Julian was born. Maybe they figured American audiences would be more interested in that or would take it better or something. It's possible. Like it made him seem more harmless because he was a married man, a wholesome married man. Yeah, I think I think that's probably correct. That's probably what the motivation was. I could see that. So also on the bill that night were actress and singer Tessie O'Shea, actor, comedian, and impressionist Frank Gorshin, acrobats Wells and the Four Fays, the comedy team of McCall and Brill. And the kids of Oliver, including a young Davy Jones as the Artful Dodger, which I think is pretty cool. Amazing. The future monkey would be there. Yes. And Davy Jones had once said that he heard the screams that night and thought to himself, quote, I'd like a little bit of this action. Two years (laughs) later, he became one of the monkeys. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Famous last words there, Dave. This was not a good night for many of these other acts. And uh, they were completely overshadowed by the Beatles, a band that many of them had never heard of. And they were performing for an audience that was so unlike the usual Ed Sullivan show audience that their acts just weren't going to go over in the same way. There is a wonderful This American Life segment. It's from 2005. And it's about Mitzi McCall and Charlie Brill. And they describe this day and this night from their perspective. It's amazing because you never hear this side of the story. They talk about how they got the worst dressing room that was up on the top floor with the soda machine. And then John Lennon came upstairs. They didn't know who he was. He made him buy him a soda. Then he just (laughs) sat there and was like drawing them and chatting. And they didn't know this guy was. They were just like, he needs to get out of here because Ed Sullivan just changed our act with two hours to go because he did that during the dress rehearsal, not thinking that the audience would be, I think what he said was sophisticated enough to understand their act. (laughs) They had an absolutely horrible, (laughs) horrible experience. They said at the time of this broadcast, they hadn't watched it for 40 years. They'd never, they never wanted to see their performance and they didn't get the seal of approval from Ed Sullivan, which was Ed calls you over to stand with him and talk to him after your performance. So very different perspective on this day. That's so interesting. Yeah, you never think about the other acts, but it was such a different demographic targeting than it would be for the Beatles. I'm sure McCall and Brill were like, 
these girls, it's like an audience full of young girls. This is not who we play for. This is not who finds us funny. I mean, they were relatively young. They were only 26 when they did it, but they were like borscht belt comedians. Yeah. That was not their audience. Right after the Beatles first set, there was a guy who came on doing card tricks. (laughs) Tessie O'Shea was like a vaudevillian type actor who's fantastic. She has like real like Ethel Merman energy, but she played the banjo and sang a song that I find really unfortunate now in 2024 called Two Ton Tessie from Tennessee. That was her nickname was Two Ton Tessie. Yeah. Her act was centered around the size of her body. Boo. We hate it. I know it's terrible, which sucks because she's actually got a great voice and she's really talented. Um, She was in Bed Knobs of Broomsticks, so we love her. But then, you know, also Davy Jones, we've got the cast of Oliver, dancers, acrobats. What a strange bill. I know. It's so weird. And it's, you know, emblematic of that time in American culture where Mm -hmm. probably for the last time that was exciting to people. And it's always funny to me on a sidebar, like Ed Sullivan, I love watching What's My Line. The old one was John Daly hosting. I love it. And I get obsessed with it. But the guests they have on there, they have a lot of Broadway actors. And I always think, you know, what was middle America? Do they care that like Broadway people were, you know, like on these shows? Yes, they did. Did they really? Broadway was much more ingrained into popular music than it is now. Soundtrack albums were a big deal. There were a lot of tours. You know, there was always a thing about Broadway shows. You know, this is great in New York, but is it going to play in Peoria? Because they always did these big national tours. When more people played the piano at home, Broadway sheet music was a, a really okay. big part of it. And you you look at like the Beatles doing Till There Was You and You'll Never Walk Alone, you know, songs like that that are musical theater songs that you'd never see a pop artist do now. It was much more acceptable back then because it was part of the popular culture. Wow. You're a big Broadway musical lover. So yeah, thank you for uh, educating me. That's what my expensive college degree was put to use for. Great. <laughs> oh, I love it. No, that that's so true. And it's so funny because the Beatles were so hesitant to record Till There Was You. But looking back, that was a good move. I would guess Paul wasn't all that upset about it. Well, I can see Paul being like, oh, this is great. Like, I get to sing this schmaltzy Broadway tune. And look adorable. It'd be Paul Ramon. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> he That's some big Paul Ramon energy uh-huh. right there. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, my God. I love it. So, okay, so the Beatles play at the show. It's amazing. And then after the show, this would be the part where I'd want to hang out. Murray the K took the Beatles to the Playboy Club, but then they went to the Peppermint Lounge until 4 a.m. And I believe the Ronettes went with them, which, again, lots of Ronettes and I'm here for it. They must have had the best time. Oh, yeah, I bet. Like the Peppermint Lounge. If I could go back in time and go to one New York City menu, it might have been the Peppermint Lounge because it was just twisting, just twisting forever. And, you know, if you've ever heard the Joey D and the Starlight song Peppermint Twist, that was inspired by the lounge and they would play that song and obviously everybody would twist and it was just great fun. Well, before we wrap up and talk about the other two performances and the aftermath of Ed Sullivan, We teased this a little bit earlier, but Erica, so Neil Aspinall did not rock out on the guitar, but somebody else may have. Well, maybe. And that person who overdubbed the Beatles may be my grandfather. Well, he's definitely my grandfather, but he may have overdubbed the Beatles. And here's the story. And if you know me, you've probably heard it before. So, you know, skip forward 10 minutes or so if you don't want to hear it again. But for those of you who haven't, My grandfather was high white. He was a professional jazz guitarist who began his career with the Woody Herman Orchestra in the 30s and the 40s. After leaving Woody Herman in 1944, he went on to play with people like Frank Sinatra, Doris Day, Danny Kaye, the Andrews Sisters, just to name a few. He was also a very well-known author of a number of instructional guitar books, and he taught guitar to lots of people who went on to great things including both Paul Simon and Carly Simon. It was once noted in the Huffington Post, quote, in New York in the 1960s and 70s, if you mentioned High White's name in the right crowd, you'd draw gasps. 
Mr. White was like the tennis coach who trains the Williams sisters, oh. the stealth guru of jazz guitar in New York City. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's pretty cool. He was like one of those people, like one of the most famous musicians you've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> but in addition to all of these things that he did, he had a day job. It wasn't your traditional day job. It was, in fact, more of a night job. He was actually the guitar player for Ed Sullivan's house band, the Ray Block Orchestra, from the mid-50s to the mid-60s. As a member of Ray Block Orchestra, High was called for the February 9th, 1964 episode to play, among other things, the usual intros, outros, incidental music, the orchestral accompaniment, the Oliver performance. Of course, that meant that he was also around for the Beatles' historic first performance, as well as the pre-recorded set that ended up being their third appearance. He couldn't have cared less this was not his kind of music, and, you know, he was just doing his job. But his son, my dad, who was 16 at the time, was nuts about the group. Unfortunately, that day, staff's family members were not allowed in. Given the thousands of write-in ticket requests, it probably wasn't fair, so... There was a policy nobody was allowed to bring family members that day. But he did get an autograph. And the way he got that autograph is that he found a scrap of paper laying around. He got a pencil and he went around and got all four Beatles to sign it. The fact that we have a Beatles autograph of all four Beatles is incredible enough. But what makes it more incredible is that scrap of paper. Because when you turn over this autograph, it just so happens to be on the back of that day's rehearsal call sheet. And this is a fascinating document. It shows the date, the call times for each act and their dressing rooms. You can see on it that the Beatles were called that day at 9.30 a.m. You can see other acts like Davy Jones. He had his own dressing room, a call in Brill. They were called from one o'clock. And that terrible dressing room with the soda machine was number 62. And so we have this incredible piece of Beatles history. That is so, so cool. I mean, of all the things, it's the call sheet. Like, I, that just always blows my mind. But there's some more to the story. He told us a second part of the story that uh, we even got on tape, amazingly enough. You know, my brother had one of those interview one of your older relatives sort of middle school projects. And so we got this story on videotape. Mm -hmm. And he told the story that he had overdubbed some of the guitar on at least one of the Beatles songs. You know, the details are murky. He remembered it, of course, but not really caring about the band. He didn't remember what song it was or have any real excitement about it. It was, it was a job to him like any other job. You know, he was never <laughs> one to brag or embellish, you know, that, that wasn't his style. So just the matter-of-fact way he told us, it makes me think that it happened. Now, evidence of whether or not it happened beyond his telling of it, we don't have that. I actually emailed Mark Lewison maybe almost 10 years ago, probably, just telling him the story and asking him what he thought it was. He thought that if it happened and if it existed, the likeliest scenario was that the overdubs were broadcast on one of the summer 1964 reruns. But not all of those episodes are available. And the ones that are, they're in the CBS vault. So there's really no hard evidence to prove that there was ever an altered version of the Beatles' performances aired on TV. I could also see, you know, because the third appearance was pre-recorded, maybe that was overdub because it wasn't live. That's actually a really good theory and probably the most logical, right? I mean, they had a couple of weeks to review. It was the third appearance. It was live. They were getting these huge audience numbers. And if they heard something that they didn't think was quite right and could be better, you know, why not give it a little tweak, right? Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to have to go listen to them again and see if I can hear them. Yes. <laughs> see if you can channel your grandfather. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So, you know, for a story like this, there's usually not any updates. It's, you know, 60 years old. But a really interesting thing happened just last year, actually. Yes. Last summer, Paul McCartney's book, 1964, Eye of the Storm, came out. And if you haven't seen it, you should, because it's amazing. It was a series of photos that Paul himself had taken on this whirlwind Beatlemania tour they were lost for decades and they were found. These photos were found in the MPL archives. 
So Paul McCartney and MPL put a book together, and the photos from that book were later made into an exhibit currently at the Chrysler Museum and is coming to the Brooklyn Museum in the spring. So, you know, I'm looking through the book and I've always looked to see if I could find any pictures of my grandfather on that day with around near the Beatles, just in the room. And I never have. In fact, there was even uh, CBS 10 years ago for the 50th anniversary. They released some of the photos of that day from the vault. And there was a picture of the Beatles signing autographs for a staff member sometime during that day. And I always figured that was probably like he was probably like right there in front or behind and just didn't make the photo and could never find him. So imagine my total shock when I'm looking through Paul McCartney's book and there's a picture in the Ed Sullivan section, two pictures actually, of my grandfather getting that autograph signed, that autograph that I have now in my house by John Lennon, and the photos were taken by Paul McCartney. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. It's an incredible, amazing thing. I actually flew to London a few months ago just to make sure I saw the exhibit and I wanted to see it there in London. And he was there on the wall, really huge picture, you know, blown up really big compared to what I saw in the book. And it was just incredible. It was so cool. Unreal. Unreal. I just, it blows my freaking mind. This whole story, I mean, it's, it gives me chills. It's like you can't write this stuff, you know? And yeah. the fact that there is that photograph, which just proves the provenance, you know, of those autographs. For people who are into provenance, this is, this is a good yeah, one. Yeah. You got to go on like Antiques Roadshow with this shit. I'll never sell it. You're going to pry it from my cold, dead hands. Yeah. Yeah. But it would be interesting to know for sure. I mean, I don't know. I just feel like, Okay, it's a full set of Beatles autographs. That's worth a lot. But it's also on the back of the damn call sheet. And it was done during the Ed Sullivan rehearsals. Like, and it doesn't get better than that. Like, I, I don't know, Erica, you have a priceless piece of Beatles memorabilia. Yeah, you're probably right. I should, uh, should put it in a nicer frame. I really should. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm privileged. I think I've gotten to see this in person. And uh, yeah, I feel very privileged for that. Oh, I'm, I'm sure you did. It's always up. It's always out. Yes. Uh, I love it. Well, God, that is such an amazing story. I love it. I never get tired of hearing that story about your grandfather. And uh, we probably told it before on the podcast, but this isn't the last time we're going to tell it yeah. as much as possible. Whenever it's applicable, you're going to hear about High White. Yeah, exactly. You definitely are. And he was on the Ed Sullivan show one time. He and his friends in the orchestra wrote a song called Eddie Kiss Me Goodnight, which was Topo Gigio's <laughs> tagline. And uh, it was a little instrumental. And my <laughs> grandfather was the one that did the Topo Gigio impression in the song. So. Oh, my God. Did he really? That's yeah. so cute. Oh, my gosh. We haven't seen it for a while because... CBS pulled it for copyright, so I'm hoping that it shows up again someday. Boo. No. That's so cool. Oh, my God. I, I d never met your grandfather, obviously, but I love him. I'm so starstruck by <laughs> your grandfather and, like, the story. It just, I'm, like, I can't get enough of, like, hearing the story over and over. <laughs> he was a cool dude. Well, I could talk about your grandfather all day. <laughs> um so let's get back into the Sullivan show. Let's find out what the reviews were like. And uh, spoiler, not amazing. Of course. They just love to yuck our yum with the Beatles. So Newsweek said, visually, they are a nightmare. Tight, dandified, Edwardian slash beatnik suits and great pudding bowls of hair. Musically, they are a near disaster. Guitars and drums slamming out a merciless beat that does away with secondary rhythms, harmony, and melody. Jesus. I know. God, this guy does not pull punches. Their lyrics, punctuated by nutty shouts of yeah, 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 are a catastrophe. A preposterous farrago of Valentine card romantic sentiments. And uh, the article ends with a prediction. The odds are they will fade away, as most adults confidently predict. Which, okay, adults, sure, but the teenagers are the tastemakers. Let's be real. Hope this guy didn't take his luck to the track. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, dude, don't play the lottery. Nope. You're going to lose. <laughs> I bet he ate his words. I hope so. So two days later, following the Ed Sullivan show, the Beatles performed their first U.S. concert in Washington, D.C., 
And then they returned to New York City for a concert at Carnegie Hall. And then after that, they left for Miami, where they would perform live for their second Ed Sullivan appearance, uh, which is broadcast from the Deauville Hotel on February 16th. And there they played She Loves You, This Boy, All My Loving. I saw her standing there from me to you. And I want to hold your hand, of course, as they were wont to do at that point. And that was watched by 70 million people. So a tiny little drop off from the first appearance, but not much. No. That was pretty significant. Still enormous. That's a weird weekend. That's something we should talk about one day. Yeah, they got some much needed time off. But like, there are so many stories that came out of that weekend. Like, I mean, one of my favorite things and, you know, Erica, you have the Brian doll to prove it. But that was where Brian was photographed wearing the stamp out the Beatles sweatshirt. Yes. I mean, you know, they went on a boat, they went on the beach, you know, they were out and about. They had, uh, yeah, had some downtime. But yeah, that, that weekend was pretty, pretty interesting. Can you imagine their impressions of Miami? I mean, New York and London, there's some symmetry there. They're cosmopolitan. Yeah. And it's, it's cold and it's dark and it's gray and there's, you know, lots and lots of people. They've seen that before, but Miami is like another planet. Yeah, exactly. And they hadn't been to like the Bahamas at this point. Like, I'm sure they, well, I don't know. It was pretty early in their career. I don't think they probably would have taken tropical vacations. So yeah, they, uh, you know, did their time in Miami. And then they would reappear on the show on February 23rd for their pre-taped appearance, taped on February 9th. But they would only appear one more time on the show in 1965. And that was also a pre-recorded segment. It was broadcast on September 12th, but it was taped on August 14th, which was one day before they kicked off their North American tour that year. And then they would send their music videos to Sullivan. So Sullivan would still occasionally play Beatles videos throughout the years. And they say that Ed himself always had a fondness for the Beatles. He always kind of thought of them in the same way as the like young, clean cut boys that he met in 1964. Well, I think his nickname at one point was Uncle Beatle. (laughs) Yeah, and he had photos of him wearing a beetle wig, and I think he had a good sense of humor about all of it. Yeah. For sure. So the aftermath in the Sullivan shows, these performances cumulatively feature 20 Beatles songs, and seven of those became number one hits, which is pretty astounding. The shows attracted a quarter of a billion people. Huge. Absolutely massive. And the first two shows are still the highest viewed, regularly scheduled television programs of all time. Even today, regularly scheduled television program. I don't know how hyper specific that is, but I mean, that's pretty substantial, I think. And when you think about finales to major shows like MASH was such a big deal. Oh, yeah. Everybody watched it. Dallas. Yeah. In the 80s, you know, all the musty TV in the 90s, too. It's it's yeah, this was still the higher viewed and Very importantly, this also kicked open the door for other British Invasion acts to appear on Ed Sullivan and on primetime TV in America. It really gave validity to the staying power of British acts. So thanks, Ed Sullivan. Thanks for taking a chance on these Beatle Boys and for giving a platform to the rest of the British Invasion. Yeah, and for really opening the door to a cultural revolution. I don't think anybody would have thought that it would have this much of an impact 60 years later that we commemorate this moment. Who would have had that foresight? Maybe Brian, maybe a Sullivan, but who knows? But a television variety show. Yeah. Doing that. Exactly. And how many other specific episodes of Ed Sullivan? You know, maybe, maybe Elvis, but that's it. Elvis. And a funny note too. Uh, my grandfather played for that one as well. And, uh, He ended up being chased out the stage door because some girls saw a guy with a guitar coming out of the stage door and figured he must be Elvis. He didn't look like Elvis when he got up close for sure, (laughs) but uh, fun times. Oh my gosh, man. Well, that is the story of the Beatles making it to Ed Sullivan. Happy 60th anniversary. I I hope you, uh, you celebrate in style in some way. Yes, exactly. Watch the episode. You can find it online. Not necessarily on YouTube, but it exists out there. The whole thing is out there with the amazing, amazing ads. Yes. Those crazy like Anison ads and shit. It's crazy. It's like a pendulum swinging and it's like pain, depression, 
headache, anxiety. <laughs> yes. Take two innocents, make all this go away. It's yes. crazy. It's, it's so dark. I know. Those commercials, man, they would not fly on, on TV today. <laughs> I love it so much. Oh, me too. It's so good. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode. We enjoyed it. That was really fun. Yeah. To talk about Ed Sullivan. And thanks again for listening to BC The Beatles. And as always, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening right now. And please give us a rating slash review so other Beatle maniacs can find us. And follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, slash X, and TikTok. We'll be posting videos and photos and more from this episode and beyond. If you are in New York City and coming to the Fest for Beatles fans, please come by and say hi to me 2 o'clock Sunday. And remember, yes. you can always email us at bcthebeatles at gmail.com. See you next time. Bye. Bye.